titled Pure Joy, Hard Times, Temptations, Listening and Taking Action. That's a lot, right? That's a lot. And you may or may not be able to figure, just from this collection of words, that we're going to be coming out of the first chapter of the book of James today. So if you'll turn there, we're going to start in James chapter 1. Now a little backdrop on the book of James. All right. It is written by James, the brother of Jesus, most experts and theologians believe. And though he was Jesus' biological brother, in time he did become a follower of Christ and believed Jesus was the Messiah. That had to be complicated yeah. in that household. But he saw what he saw and he came to believe. And so James went on to become one of uh, the significant leaders in the early church, leading the church in Jerusalem. And if you know a little bit about the book of Acts, a great persecution broke out in Acts chapter 8 against Christians in Jerusalem. Anybody know why would they persecute Christians in Jerusalem? Anybody got an idea as to why they would, why they would want to give Christians a hard time in the city of Jerusalem? Yeah, Aaron Hebron? Uh, because they want to get the establishment. Okay, so the establishment was, anybody know that one? What was the establishment in Jerusalem at the time? The Jewish way of life. The Jewish way of life. And that was led by and over, uh, overseen by Pharisees, Sadducees, uh, teachers of the law, the law of Moses, things like that. And so this idea that Jesus was the Messiah. Hey guys, the Messiah came. He was here. And you either missed it or you killed him or both. And so this idea got Christians in a lot of trouble, and they got chased out of Jerusalem. As part of that, Christians got scattered all over the place, and that's what a lot of the book of Acts is about. Well, James, the leader of the church in Jerusalem, he stayed behind. According to legend, he eventually lost his life because of it. He was martyred. Right? Matter of fact, not even according to legend. It's actually recorded there in the book of Acts that James does get it. He gets killed. But before that happens, he writes this letter to those Christians who had been scattered. Okay, so that's the backdrop of what we're about to read, and that's the guy who was penning these words. It's a relatively short letter, and it is going to get to the point uh, to things that are still pretty common to us in the present day. We can relate to a lot of the things, or at least we feel like we can, to a lot of the things that are contained in this letter. It's going to be a bit of an interactive message today. All right. Uh, which is something we like to do from time to time. And we're going to start off, if someone would please read as part of that interaction, uh, verses 1 through 4 in the book of James. Okay, Jake has got it. James, the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the, among the nations, greetings. Consider pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kind. Because you know that the testament of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Okay. So, did you catch that in verse 2? Consider it what? Yeah. Pure joy. Whenever you face what? Trials. Trials. Hard times. Trials of many kinds. And then he goes on and says why in verse 3. He says, because you know that the testing of your faith develops something. What does it develop? Perseverance. Perseverance. Perseverance, by the way, in verse 4, as it scales upward, must finish its work. Has to. Must is an imperative. It's not optional. Perseverance has a job to do in each of our lives. By nature, we like to run from trouble, right? I like to make my life as easy as it could possibly be. I don't know about you, but I like when things go smoothly. That's much preferable. However, do you have to persevere much when things are going well? No. You really don't. Right? If you're a baseball fan and you're a fan of the Cleveland Indians, you've been persevering through 88 <laughs> years <laughs> since the last time that they won a World Series. Right? Cubs fans finally got to break their drought a few years back. They waited 105 years. Right? Perseverance is something that we go through, whether it's at work, 
at home, in our personal health, it's there. And what does James say? Consider it pure joy. When you have to go through trials that force you to persevere. I don't know about you, but that sounds like nonsense. <laughs> it sounds sort of backwards. I like to consider it pure joy when things are going well. Right. Not when things are going poorly. But he unlocks something here in verse 4. He says, look, you need the perseverance. It has to finish its work so that something might happen. So that what? If you take another look at verse 4, so that you may be mature yep. and complete, not lacking anything. What happens to us when we always get what we want? We get entitled. We get entitled. We have a word for that with children. What's the word? Spoiled. Sometimes we attach brat. Right? A child who, when they hear the word no, goes into a fit, stomps their feet, whines, so on and so forth. And we look at them and go, brat. What does that child need? That child needs perseverance. <laughs> What they need is to learn that they can't always have what they want in the time that they want. And what happens to us as we develop as human beings, as we go from children into adulthood, as we adjust and recognize that not everything can happen to us in the moment we want, in the way that we want, we call that maturity. And maturity is a good thing. So take it all the way back to what he said in verse 2. Consider it pure joy. Who wants to be mature? All of us. In order for that to happen, we have to have some struggle, some trial. We have to persevere. And that perseverance is what brings that maturity, which is why it's pure joy when we go through hard times. Now remember, who is he writing this to? People who were persecuted and scattered for their faith. They're going through trials as they're reading these words or hearing these words read to them. Trials that probably make ours seem fairly small. Just something to keep in mind. All right, we're going to continue reading. In verses 5 through 8, he goes on and uh, he says there, If any one of you lacks wisdom... He should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault. He doesn't need to see your qualifications. And it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt. Because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think that he will receive anything from the Lord. He's double-minded and unstable in all that he does. We're told here, or instructed, that perseverance uh, is going to help us to mature, and it has to happen. And then we're reminded that wisdom should be sought. I mean, when you think about maturity, doesn't it kind of go hand in hand with wisdom? Yeah. Right? And so you can kind of learn one or two different ways here. You can learn through perseverance. That's kind of the hard way. Or another way is offered to us here in verses 5 through 8. We could just... Pray for wisdom. Which one would you rather have? Mm -hmm. Would you rather have to drag your way through all sorts of difficulties so that you can finally learn, yep, the stove was hot. Oh, yep, driving the speed limit will save me money. Oh, yep, or at least reasonably close to the speed limit. I mean, we could go the hard way. And we could take a lot of lumps and learn a lot of things. There's a great quote that says, Good judgment comes from experience. And most of that experience comes from bad judgment. It's from Will Rogers. We can learn the hard way. Or, what if? We can just pray for wisdom. What if we could just ask God, Lord, show me what I should be doing here. Guide my feet. Send me some wisdom. 
Who's he giving wisdom out to, according to what James just told us here? Those who ask for it. Those who ask for it. And, expect it. Right? And, who, and who believe that they'll receive it. And he's giving it freely, it says, to all without finding fault. Without going, all right, Robert, I don't know about you. I think, I think you don't really want wisdom for you know, good purposes. You just want to look smart. Look, God's good with us getting wisdom. Why? Why would God want us to have wisdom? Well, what do we know about God? Does He care about us? Sure. Yes. What evidence do we have that He uh, cares about us? How can we tell He cares about us, Aaron? Christ Himself. Yeah, Jesus, the Lord. What did we just do? We took communion. What's that? It's a commemoration, right, of Jesus' offering of His body and blood. Where did he do that? On the cross. Right? So if you need evidence that God cares, look no further than the cross. Look no further than Jesus. So God cares about us. So why would someone who cares about us want us to have wisdom? Gina? It helps us make good choices and live a good life. That's right. How many of you are parents? Okay. And when your kids make good choices, how do you feel as a parent? You feel great. You feel great. You feel proud of them. And what does it do for your, your, your relationship with the child? Reinforces it. Yeah, it does. It, it, it strengthens that relationship. And it even makes you kind of want to give them a little bit more liberty and a little bit more freedom. Because you're like, they're not going to do silly things with it. They have wisdom. I can let them outside of just the confines of the backyard. Right? They can ride their bike all the way to the corner and back. Yeah. Right? And then once they show that they've got enough wisdom to ride all the way to the corner and back, eventually we may like let them go even further <coughs> than that. Wisdom is good for our kids. It helps them make good choices, and from those good choices, reap the fruit and good benefits, right? And so since we care about our kids, we want them to have wisdom. wisdom. And so since God cares about us, He wants us to have wisdom. wisdom. And so He's giving it to us as long as we ask and we believe without doubt. How often do you pray for wisdom? You should pray for wisdom a lot. And you probably noticed that when you do that, God gives you opportunities to learn things. And wisdom increases. But when you don't ask for it much, that usually comes from a heart of feeling like, I don't need any more wisdom. I'm all stocked up. I'm as smart as I can get. I'm so wise. I don't need anything else. Now, none of us would probably say that out loud. But when we stop praying for wisdom, that is exactly what we're communicating. Right. I don't need any more. I'm fine. Just like I am. So you can go through perseverance, or you can just ask for wisdom. Great works are performed not by strength, but by perseverance. By hanging in there. So when you're going through, hey, what if you coupled these two things together? What if while you were in the midst of a trial and having to persevere, you said, God, what is it that you're wanting me to learn in this moment? Give me wisdom mm -hmm. to see it. Now you're a double threat guy. <laughs> you're going through perseverance and gaining maturity, and you are asking God to give you wisdom throughout the process. Oh, wow. That is when the explosive growth really happens in the life of of a Christian. And why God gets excited about it. Let's talk about temptation. Oh wait, wrong temptation. <laughs> okay, so we're going to continue reading, and if I could get someone to read here, verses 9 through 11. 9 through 11. Mike Gibbs. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun, rises court, the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossoms fall and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. 
You know, we're reminded that good times are temporary in this set of passages here. It's very tempting, though, to see it the opposite. I mean, the only reality we've ever been a part of is this one. We haven't seen the hereafter. We don't know what heaven looks like. We don't have the benefit of any of that. There is one uh, significant area where Jesus was very much not like us. He was human in every way, but he was also, he was God in every way. And one thing Jesus had that we don't have, he had, he had seen the realm outside of this one. That's right. Which has to have been helpful in overcoming temptation. Sure. Yeah. He knew what lies beyond, and that whatever was being offered here was just not worth giving up what was over there. If you've got a, a, a refrigerator full of, you know, your, your favorite foods, it's a little less tempting to stop off at Quick Trip after work and grab whatever's in the, in the chute there. That's right. With the heated lamps. <laughs> <laughs> you know that something good is waiting. You know, your spouse has called you and said, oh, steaks are on the grill. Hurry home. Yeah, I'm not going to Quick Trip and getting a corn dog. <laughs> I'm not wasting my time. Corn dogs are fine. But that steak is way better. And so temptation gets linked to this, you know, few verses that we just read here. We're going to get into temptation verses specifically after this one. But this idea that our current circumstances of wealth or security are more important or more lasting or that's what we should put our faith in or our security in, my education, the size of my house, the size of my bank account, so on and so forth. Hey, look, James says that stuff is like a flower. It's real pretty for about a week. We got all sorts of flowers in our yard. We've got something blooming at all different times. Right now it's the brown eyed Susans that have just started up and we've got some kind of cool pink ones. I don't even know their name, but the pink ones are already starting to die. They just bloomed like a week ago, and now some of them are all wilted and they're falling over and their petals are falling off. That's what happens with flowers. They're incredible for about five minutes, <laughs> right? That's our wealth, you guys. I mean, I'm not discouraging people from, you know, being responsible with your money and things of that nature. That's good. But if that's where you've got your hope, it's going to be gone in like five minutes. Right. When you pass away, your ability to use your debit card is gone. <laughs> True. Right? So we'll continue here. If someone wants to read, so don't fall into that temptation. Now we're going to read verses 13 through 18, if I could get a volunteer on that one. James chapter 1, verse 13 through 18. We're going to have James read it. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Yeah. Which verse am I reading? 218. 18. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Thank you. All right, so in these few verses, we're told not to blame our temptations, or more specifically, our sins, on anyone else. Temptation is not abnormal. Temptation is actually normal. You will be tempted today. Some of you are being tempted even as we speak. Right? Temptation is common. What we've allowed ourselves on some level to believe is that sin has to be common too. It doesn't. What is God's expectation? That we don't sin. Is that not the standard? It is. This few verses enlightens us to what happens in the process. First, we get tempted, normal. But then it says we let our own evil desires do something. What do they, what do, they do? They entice us. And then after we're enticed, they give birth to us. 
Yeah, they, 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 they entice us, they tempt us, and then it says in verse, specifically in verse 14, dragged away. dragged away. We get lured. We get lured away, away from what was right, away from what was good. We find ourselves distant now from the path that we're supposed to be on. And once we're isolated and dragged away, we become pretty easy prey. Right? And that is where, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. See, temptation is not, a, not wrong. It's not our favorite. But it's not wrong. What we do in the face of that temptation, that is our responsibility. The scriptures say, don't blame God. He doesn't tempt anybody. He's not trying to drag you away and entice you with anything wrong. God is pure. It's our own evil desires that get tempted and enticed. And then we get dragged away. And that is where sin gives birth. And when it is full grown, what does it say in verse 15? It gives us death. The wage of sin is death. So don't be deceived. All the good things you have, your, wit, your riches, your security, your wealth, you may think you did that. And you had a role in it, to be sure. But every good thing came from somewhere. It says where it came from in verse 17, from above, coming down from the Father. He's the one who gives the blessings. It is so easy to get tempted to get more focused on the blessings than the one who is the blesser. Mm -hmm. Right. And we can find ourselves feeling like, I'm just so busy. I'm just so weighed down. I've got so much happening in life. Well, how much of that stuff, let me ask you, is stuff that you don't have to be doing. But it's a blessing that you're chasing after, that you're enjoying, and that you have welcomed to take more of your time. And so James says, hey, let's keep it in perspective. Your wealth goes away like a flower. Don't be tempted into thinking it's going to last any longer than that. Don't get led away and enticed by your wealth, by the things that don't last. But understand that those things came from somewhere. They came from above. That'll help us not get too tricked by them. Okay, so then we move on. We you know, read verses 19 through 21. This is about listening here. Who wants to read verse 19 through 21 for us? Okay, Aaron Art. <clears throat> My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For a man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Great passage. We're encouraged to listen here. Quickly. Quick. What does that mean, to be quick to listen? What, what would that look like, Aaron Heber? First, it means closing your mouth. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Anybody else? What does, that, what does that look like, to be quick to listen? Close your mouth? Can you pay attention? Pay attention? Okay, yeah. Catrice? So you can get a better understanding. Okay, seek a better understanding. Like, I'm looking to listen. You know, there might be more than just two types of people in the world, but let's throw all of us into one of them. Right, yeah, yeah. There's those of us who just love to hear ourselves talk, <laughs> and I might be in that category. Oh, boy. <laughs> and then there's those of us who, they would rather listen. They're great listeners. Their default setting is, rather than me going in here and assuming I know stuff, yeah. let me listen first. Let me examine. Let me hear what's being said. And what we're encouraged to do is be more like that. Quick to listen. Slow to speak. It doesn't say don't speak. Yeah. Speak at the right time. I think often we love to spout our opinions. And make no mistake about it, friends. It, it, our opinions matter. Right? <laughs> and we're passionate about them. And God's passionate about us. So he cares about our opinions and our thoughts. But all of those things have to be subservient to our lordship, 
you know, Jesus' lordship in our lives. So whatever opinion we've got, we've got to run it through the filter of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And if our opinion doesn't match what Jesus wants or what the scriptures teach us, then our opinion has to bend. Right. Right? Or bow. And our opinion gets influenced by what we watch, by what we listen to, by what we allow to, to overtake the stream on our social media. You know they got an algorithm, right? They know what you slow down and watch, even if you slow down for just a couple seconds. <laughs> they record that. Oh, he slowed down over that picture, and suddenly you start seeing more of those. Sure. You read an article, and they'll start sending you more articles that are related to the one you just read. And so you think, I just see this all over my news feed. Well, there's a lot of other stuff you're not seeing because you never slowed down on those or you never read those other perspectives. So we get bent a little bit by the things that we consume, whether it's on television, uh, on social media, uh, on podcasts or the radio, whatever, the books we read. None of us are immune from them, which is why we've got to be careful not to be quick to speak because we just learned all this stuff. Let me tell you about everything I learned. I know all sorts of things. Listen to this, listen to this, listen, 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 because I learned all this stuff. But we're encouraged to be quick to listen, slow to speak. Have I heard the other perspective yet? The first to present their case always seems right until another one comes along. If I'm quick to speak instead of quick to listen, I'm going to miss a whole other vantage point. That's really important. All right. So then he wraps up the chapter here. Talking about taking action. And in verse 22, he says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, but do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets or disregards what he looks like. But the man who gives, I'm sorry, but the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he's heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. We're reminded that just hearing God's word doesn't mean much. Congratulations. You came to church today. And we've read the first chapter of the book of James. Cool. Good first step. But it doesn't mean much if all we do is leave it here. He uses an analogy here about a mirror. He talks about the, the, the law as a mirror. Right? We could say maybe that the, the Word of God, that's our mirror. And we can look at it. Right? And then walk away and disregard what it says. And that would be foolish. Just like a man who looks in a mirror and notices it. he's got a huge toothpaste stain here on his shirt. He just got a little aggressive with the brushing. Right? He got all foam down on there. And he saw the stain. Right? But then he didn't do anything about it. So he just leaves the house and he goes to work. And his co-workers are like, you all right, bud? What's, what's all over your shirt? Oh, it's a toothpaste thing. You knew it was there? Oh, yeah, I knew it was there. I saw it in the mirror today. All your co-workers would wonder, why then did you not change your shirt? Come on. Right. Down. The Word of God is our mirror. And when we look intently into the Word, it's going to show us wrinkles and stains and hairs that are out of place. And we can opt to walk away and do nothing about it. But that would be the work of a fool. Or we could say, oh, I see what you have revealed, O mirror, mirror, on the wall. And I'm changing my shirt. I'm changing my ways. Changing my attitude. Hearing the word is great. Doing what it says is even greater. And then he gives us, in closing the chapter, an example of just exactly how to do that. In verse 26, it says, If anyone considers himself religious, and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, 
He deceives himself and his religion is worthless. Look out. Here it comes. If you're letting stuff fly out of your mouth that is not fitting for a Christian, your religion, I'm, I'm not saying it, the Bible said it, your religion is worthless. You're not as religious as you think you are. Our tongue, he gets into this in a later chapter, it's, it's something that needs to be bridled. It needs to be guided. And if we don't keep a tight rein on it, we deceive ourselves. We've got to watch what comes out of our mouth. The temptation to say something is there. Temptation, again, is not necessarily wrong. And once you feel it percolating itself up, <laughs> past your heart, up your throat, and it starts working your way toward the front rows of your teeth. And it's getting ready to escape your lips. You've had some time to consider, should I let this out? And if you've got to cover your mouth with both hands, <laughs> if you've got to clench your teeth, if you've got to roll your eyes and walk away, all those things are preferable. Because once words get out, they really can't be taken back. No. It's like toothpaste out of a tube. A lot of toothpaste analogies in this one. <laughs> Verse 27, religion that our God and Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. Look after orphans and widows in their distress. And keep yourself from being polluted by the world. That is good religion. That's religion that God accepts. He accepts it as pure. One action we can always take and hit a home run with is being generous. Amen. Being generous and helpful to those who are in vulnerable circumstances. Today we took a collection, a hope collection for the Skyline program in Chicago. On the, the, the south side and near west side of Chicago, about 900 murders a year. Wow. And these kids are, when they hear gunshots, it's not uncommon. Mm. Now that's going to have an effect on somebody. Right. And so this program is trying to help them so that they don't have to go home right after school and get right back in the mix of the neighborhood. They got a couple more hours around loving, caring adults who not only sit with them, but help them deal with some of the trauma that they've experienced. Religion that God our Father considers worthwhile is helping people like that. That's good, pure religion. So here are some things to consider as we, uh, as we take it on the road. Things to take action upon. What difficulty are you facing now? What could you ask people to pray for? Like, be honest. Hey, this is what I'm going through. I have a trial. I'm supposed to consider it pure joy. I know it's here to help me persevere and get matured. But share that with somebody. What is your trial? Ask someone to join you in prayer. How can you consider your trial pure joy? When you go through hard things, how could you see that as positive? What might be God, I'm sorry, what might God be showing you in your trials? Ask Him. Ask Him for wisdom. What suggestions can you have for one another in being victorious over these things? Maybe you've experienced a trial similar to what your friend is going through. And you can be a listening ear, quick to listen, slow to speak, but also relate. I feel your pain. I, I understand your circumstance, I think. I've been through similar things. You're not alone. Here's something that helped me. Offer that to one another. And we'll close. We'll discuss this one, and then we'll be done. Why is action louder than words? You've heard the expression. Action is louder than words. Why? Why is that true? Is it true? Jenna. Um, you said I specifically thought about people who say, I love you, how can I help you? They, and then the people that just show up, I specifically remember.
remember when our sink broke and James was in the hospital and a sister came over and washed a, over a week's worth of dishes, family of seven, a week's worth of dishes in my bathroom sink. That's love. That's not telling me I love you, I'll pray for you. That's doing it for me. And, and mm. I think words mean nothing. The actions, they carry a lot of me. Good stuff. Good stuff. Anybody else? Actions, a lot of words. Aaron. Putting a sentence together and saying I love you is not difficult. There's just so much effort and everything that Jen said. Let's say that. And Tommy. Yeah. So, you recommend that. Yeah. Stan. When you say words, there is many words. That's, anyone can make anything sound wonderful, flowery, make it sound what you want to hear as a salesperson. Right. When you actually do something, you're not only showing that you mean what you say, you're putting conviction in action. Mm -hmm. In other words, I love you great, showing that you actually love them through your acts of kindness, through what you do for somebody. I will be there and actually showing what they're supposed to be here. It means a lot more to somebody than just saying that I'm building it. Amen. Yeah. Mr. Heber. Um, Jesus saying he was the Messiah and knowing how to resolve it proved nothing, but dying on the cross and coming back to life proved that he was the Messiah. Yeah. Micah. Making vibrations with your mouth by opening it is a lot less meaningful or yeah, yeah. Because really our words are noise, right? They're just noise we all comprehend and understand, but it is just noise. Right? Great, great point. Rich. You can also get physically infused with consistently say, don't tell other people what I did. Mm. Yeah. The action and not the voice of it being spread with the action of the Yeah, what a great example. Hey. Let us go from here with worthwhile religion that the Father sees as pure by taking action even in the midst of pure joy, hard times, temptations, listening, talking, taking action. Amen.